Well, India has been getting international assistance even as it battles the COVID pandemic, the second wave of the COVID pandemic that has wreaked devastation in the country. We know Australia has been in the forefront when it comes to providing assistance to New Delhi. With me is the Australian High Commissioner to talk about the assistance. So welcome to Vion. My first question, an obvious question, what kind of assistance Australia has been sending to New Delhi as it battles the COVID pandemic? Well, thanks for this opportunity. I'm proud that Australia is standing with other countries alongside India as it battles this second wave. And last week, I was delighted to uh, see the first essential supply of medical equipment arrive in New Delhi uh, from Australia. The first chartered flight from Qantas brought more than a thousand ventilators in addition to oxygen concentrators. And uh, it was great to see them immediately handed over to the Indian Red Cross for distribution. And at the start of this week, I was delighted to be advised by the Indian government that the equipment was delivered to areas of need in Orissa, West Bengal, Jharkhand, Assam and Bihar. And I want to congratulate all those involved with the obvious speed with which it came off the plane through customs and uh, arrived in those states to help COVID patients. And uh, we can look forward to more of this because a second flight carrying additional essential medical supplies will arrive in Delhi uh, later this week. Mm -hmm. uh, so what kind of cooperation both countries are having in terms of fighting the battle uh, against COVID crisis uh, all throughout last year and this year as well? And specifically, if you can talk about uh, uh, about vaccinations as well, India is a major production center. Of course, that has been impacted because of the COVID pandemic. But uh, if you can focus on the vaccination process as well. Well, um, Australia and India from the start of the COVID crisis last year have been in close collaboration. Our foreign secretaries so in those early days of last year were speaking on a weekly basis amongst themselves and with other countries across the region about the challenges that COVID was throwing up and how uh, each was learning to deal with it. So we were sharing information from, from the start. Obviously, we saw over the year the Quad continue to develop and at the Quad meeting a month or two ago, uh, the Quad, the, the leaders decided to address a number of issues, of course, including COVID and the initiative related to a vaccine rollout across the Indo-Pacific region. And Australia, like other countries, has put money on the table, in our case, to assist with that last mile delivery of these, uh, of these vaccines. So, you know, uh, last week, again, our foreign secretary, our foreign ministers uh, spoke uh, on the sidelines of the G7 foreign ministers meeting, again, about what more Australia could do. So we will continue to be in close cooperation um, vaccinations are, are obviously important, and I noted the last time I checked the statistics that both of our countries have vaccinated something like 10% uh, of their adult population. Uh, there's a lot more for us both to do, but you know the, the issues around vaccine rollout, the issues around uh, a supply are issues that are happening, frankly, around the world. And we're keen to do whatever we can, and we look forward to, um, as, we, as we understand, uh, the vaccine manufacturing production levels increasing from about the end of July. I said when I visited uh, some of the uh, manufacturers last year that uh, whilst there are many vaccines from around the world, only one country has the manufacturing capacity to supply the world, uh, that's India. Uh, that's why we respect India. And it's why at this time, so many countries are providing assistance as India battles this vicious second wave. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, because of the second wave of the COVID pandemic, uh, your country had stopped the flights uh, uh, from India and expectedly uh, th that was to happen given the fact that there are many countries that have uh, imposed restrictions from travellers coming from uh, India. But now it looks like after 15th, that will be relaxed. Uh, repatriation flights are expected to begin. If you can talk us uh, how the flight operations are expected to start and when can we see a normalisation of flights uh, between the two countries. This is specifically given the fact that there are a lot of uh, uh, in, Indian Australians in uh, diaspora uh, in Australia which would like to move uh, between the two countries. Uh, well, you're absolutely right uh, that there's you know, seven, more than 700,000 uh, people of Indian origin uh, across Australia, one in 30 of Australian citizens. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge uh, a number of uh, Indian Australian families uh, in Australia who in a regular year we haven't had a regular year for a while, uh, would frequently travel across the Indian Ocean between both countries. Uh, we paused flights two weeks ago to um, reduce the level of infections uh, that have been recorded in our quarantine system. 
as people know, when they travel to Australia throughout this crisis, uh, they've been required to undertake two weeks of uh, quarantine and they don't come out of quarantine until uh, they test negative for COVID. It's been one of the keys in Australia's efforts to uh, reduce the level of uh, COVID uh, across Australia and Australia has been quite successful at doing that. The good news is that uh, after the first 10 days of that pause, um, the desired effect had occurred. The Prime Minister announced that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there would be a return of government facilitated flights from India to Australia, which will resume next Saturday. The goal is to return a thousand of the registered vulnerable Australians uh, to Australia over the next uh, six weeks. Um, since 2020, the start of 2020, more, almost 20,000 Australians registered with DFAT have returned from India to Australia. Uh, there are around 10,000 more wishing to do so. Um, and uh, we're keen uh, to have resumption of flights uh, resume as the safety regulations and rules in Australia permit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have been publicly lauded by your Prime Minister for reaching out and doing the counsellor services amidst the COVID pandemic. Uh, diplomats, in fact, are frontline workers as well. Uh, if you can give us the details, how did you reach out to the many Australians who were stuck here uh, in India amidst the COVID pandemic? Even uh, as we speak, there are many Australians. Uh, and how do you plan to go about in terms of reaching them and making sure that they go back to Australia as soon as possible? It was difficult at the start because there was no single list of Australians uh, uh, in India. And so the initial effort was simply to encourage uh, um, Australian citizens and permanent residents in India to register with the Department of Foreign Affairs. And in that way, we were able to identify those that might be vulnerable. Vulnerable because they had financial issues, vulnerable because of their living conditions, vulnerable because of medical conditions and other things. So. So that's been the biggest challenge. And uh, as I say, we've seen more than 20,000 Australians registered with DFAT uh, return home already. There's about another 10,000 on the list. And there would be thousands of others Indians uh, of, with Australian citizens citizenship across India who throughout this crisis have been happy to live uh, uh, in family homes uh, across this country. Uh, the key for us is to identify those vulnerable. We've identified at least 1,000. Uh, the priority with the facilitated charter flights will be to return those uh, by the end of June. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll um, return to the situation that we had uh, prior to this second wave, where either through the Middle East or through Asia, directly through Air India, uh, or in other um, uh, direct flights, uh, commercial flights, uh, we saw uh, a movement of people between uh, Australia uh, and India. But what we know, what we know uh, from Australia, which is an island a long way away, is that one of the success stories for Australia as we've dealt with COVID has been the fact that like India, we closed our borders. Like India, initially we put in place uh, flight bans. Um, we now have restrictions uh, on people leaving and coming into Australia. That's part of our um, armory of weapons in battling COVID. Uh, that is likely to remain for some time, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that uh, we won't see the return of, uh, of regular flights uh, in the coming months. Um, I think, uh, or I know yesterday the Australian budget was delivered. It predicted uh, that we might see some normality in these things uh, in the first half of next year. So, you know, the, the, these are difficult times for us all. It's not just India which is having uh, outbreaks and had outbreaks. Uh, certainly India is suffering severely from the current second wave. Uh, but we're seeing around the world that no sooner do we think we've defeated uh, this disease, but then it pops up again. And I think every country is on standby. Every country is alert. Every country is doing what they can with their citizens and with their health systems uh, to, to not only protect their communities, but when, when borders do reopen, to protect those people that visit or come to Australia to work. Mm. Uh, so now going to the geopolitics of uh, this relationship, uh, earlier this month, we saw the first ever trilateral meeting uh, between India, France and Australia. If you can just talk us about what next for this uh, grouping, this grouping has been elevated from the secretary level to a ministerial level within a matter of just six to eight months. So it looks like there is a strong intention of making sure that this grouping not only works together, but also does some kind of practical cooperation perhaps as well in coming few months and years. I, th I think you're correct. The fact that it's moved from secretary level meeting to ministerial level meeting in such a short time demonstrates the close commitment and the shared interest that uh, India, France uh, and Australia have. And that includes uh, 
their mutual interest, particularly across uh, the Indian Ocean, where uh, we all have a presence and where we all uh, seek, seek to uh, in, um, effective positive vision uh, for, uh, for the region, which is open, inclusive, uh, and, an, and, and a resilient Indo-Pacific. Uh, last week, as you said, the uh, foreign ministers of each of those countries met on the sidelines of the G7 uh, and identified a range of areas across the Indo-Pacific where they could work together, including maritime safety and security, maritime and marine and environmental issues, uh, multilateral system reform, and of course, uh, health and economic recovery uh, from the pandemic. And um, I think the trilateral, as I said, stands out for its momentum and its focus on practical solutions. And uh, better still, uh, it gives itself some deadlines. And so senior, the senior officials working group will meet again in the latter half of this year to review progress on those matters that the ministers identified for practical work uh, last week in, uh, in Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, so my last question to you is um, related to China. Uh, India has been dealing with a very aggressive China. You have been dealing with a very aggressive China. We saw the Galwan incident. Uh, what is Australia's plan when it comes to dealing with a, a very, very assertive and aggressive China? And where does India perhaps fits into uh, uh, perhaps the Australian vision of dealing with China? Well, you know, we both share the Indo-Pacific as our neighbourhood. Um, and, you know, it's also quickly becoming the world's most consequential region because of a shift of power from uh, the North Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific because of uh, the economic heft uh, that exists across the region. Uh, and of course, uh, because of the, uh, the countries that make up the region. Um, it's also the epicenter of strategic competition uh, in the world facing growing challenges, including you know, escalating tensions over territorial claims, uh, more frequent and sophisticated cyber attacks, and disinformation and foreign interference, which is being used to manipulate uh, society. So as my foreign minister you know, logically said last year, it is trouble that some countries are using the pandemic to undermine liberal democracies and promote their own more authoritarian models. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons I think why India and Australia have come closer, become closer, uh, uh, because they share a vision uh, for a positive vision, for a positive agenda for the Indo-Pacific, which is all about being stable, being open, being prosperous and respecting serenity. Uh, an Indo-Pacific that's based on strong institutions, uh, norms and the respect for laws and free from threats of military and economic uh, coercion. So we'll continue to collaborate and coordinate with India in a variety of ways, uh, but particularly with India, the US and Japan through the Quad to deliver on this agenda that uh, that uh, the, um, the Quad shares for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and that's the best way. That's the best way that we can uh, work with countries across the Indo-Pacific through, through ASEAN uh, to ensure that uh, we all sign up to a vision that respects serenity, uh, that seeks uh, to um, acknowledge that there are international rules and laws that should, should govern the way in which disputes are, are settled. Um, and of course, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, ensure that uh, order is again restored. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, sir, for speaking uh, to Vion on a range of subjects, whether it's assistance, whether it's uh, vaccination, or whether it is dealing with a very assertive China. And perhaps we can have a physical uh, uh, interview in future when, uh, in, when the COVID crisis perhaps subsides very soon in happier times. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I look forward to that. Thank you.